Um, hi, everybody. It's an incredible honor and pleasure to launch into September 2023 edition Living Histories with Radhika Nagpal, uh, whom I have assured I won't gush. So I will stop this introduction and turn it over to Radhika to tell us about Living Histories. Thank you. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I think in the in the spirit of living histories, I want, wanted to start, I wanted to actually frame my thought talk around some myths that I have been dealing with over time and, and thinking about a lot. So for those of you who have looked at me over time, um, ugh, Radhika, click on the mouse. Well, actually, it asked me to admit somebody, and so it stopped my talk. Uh, it stopped my cursor, uh, but that's uh, okay. No, you, do you want to restart? Do you want to restart? No, no, it's totally fine. It's okay. totally fine. But I wanted to start by actually showing you uh, this picture. So I think when people look at me online, they usually see this incredibly glossy brochure. Um, and it is true that I've had some really incredible uh, experiences in my life. Um, I've given a TED talk. I have lots of robots. I've studied uh, army ants in Panama and um, uh, termites in Namibia. I even got to take robots uh, onto a zero G flight and experience weightlessness. Um, and I also have uh, a husband and two kids and it turns out I also have a house with a white picket fence. <laughs> so somehow that glossy brochure is so complete. Um, and yet, you know, when I, when I look at the glossy brochure, I often just don't know who this is. <clears throat> Certainly not me, or it's not definitely how I see myself. Because of course, there are a lot of things that don't show up on this glossy brochure. Um, so for example, uh, perhaps you don't know that I grew up in a small town called Amritsar in India. And that in fact, I hated ants. <laughs> uh, in fact, I hated all insects. I also hated biology and mechanical engineering and roller coasters and chess. So it feels quite ironic that now all the things that I love and in my life are actually the things I hated as a kid, uh, except for chess, because I actually still pretty much hate chess. Perhaps you also don't know that I grew up in a conservative family where none of the women in my very large extended family held jobs and men carried on the family name. And for me, I really had no female role models uh, well into my faculty years. Perhaps you also don't know that the pandemic was actually not my first lockdown. Uh, in the 1980s, um, state-sponsored <clears throat> terrorism really changed our lives in Amritsar. And although it's quite hard for me still to even talk about it, um, I've seen bombs explode. I've seen AK-47s up close. I've been in curfews where for weeks and then we ran out of food and I lived for years with shoot at sight orders at dusk. And I actually am still afraid when the sun sets. So by high school, our family was quite poor and also quite stuck. So for me, it was really quite a miracle <laughs> um, or a series of many miracles by which I managed to come to America uh, for my undergrad on a full scholarship. And I think it's sort of interesting how we always expect students to know what they're going to do early in their life when in reality, things uh, happen to be quite different. Um, I went to college, not because I loved science or engineering, but my college goal was really just to get a degree that would get me a job, that would get me enough money so I could divorce any man who mistreated me. <laughs> Seems like a small goal. Uh, but it actually was the start of my career. But it was really during this escape uh, that I learned to love science uh, and that I learned research and invention and many of the other things that, that happened to me. I see that my ability to monitor time is even worse than I thought. Have I actually used five minutes? 
I also yes, joined. Yes. I have, right? Okay. Um, many people may know me for a blog article I wrote about my seven year postdoc. Um, and those were some really special times in my life where I was able to enact the rebellion that I had always wanted to be. It is true that many of the reasons I rebelled were not great ones. Um, many people know the article, but maybe don't know the origin. But after my seven year postdoc, uh, I came back to Harvard and a lot of other things happened. So actually the most recent part of my life has involved even more rebellions. Um, perhaps people know more about my robots and my ants, but not so much about all the 10 years of fighting that I did at Harvard. Um, I've worked on parental leave discrimination, childcare laws, um, and many other harassment, bullying, retention loss. For 10 years, I tried everything possible, uh, including even trying to get Harvard sued by the Department of Justice. I guess what I would like to leave you away with is that the glossy brochure doesn't actually capture what so many of us experience behind the scenes. And to not be seen is perhaps one of the hardest things um, anyone experiences. So recently, uh, I came to Princeton, and there is a new beginning for me. Um, perhaps I will have a farm, uh, or perhaps I will just simply reinvent myself and renegotiate my relationship with society and science and academic empires. And we'll see how that goes. But in the process, one of the things that I would really like to change is the glossy brochure. And I think that's one of the things that I would like to leave you with. The glossy brochures that we create of ourselves and of others create a kind of distorted reality, one that I think is really oppressive to science and also to scientists, because it denies the, the need for compassion for ourselves and others as whole human beings. And it also denies the existence of terrible injustices within science and academia that we need to fight. I think for me, in a weird way, the glossy brochure made it hard for me to be seen. But the truth is I want to be seen. I want to be seen as somebody who had all those great experiences, but also who went through many struggles and who didn't know what they wanted to do and who fought for many things that didn't even work out. <laughs> um, I want to be real, not some fake image of an unattainable role model. And so in my new fresh start at Princeton, I've decided that things will be different. But truth be told, I don't actually know how to get rid of the glossy brochure. So instead, I guess I wanted to leave you all with a question. Is this what you imagine success to be? Many people think of me as successful. If I tell you both sides of my life, is that what you thought success looks like? Or is it that one can only be successful if in fact the glossy brochure is true, that you rid your life of all angst, all failures, all pain, all regret or setbacks. And if we do agree that we have to get rid of the glossy brochure, then is there any way to really understand what success is? I mean, what does success mean if success looks like this confusion? I've spent a lot of time pondering this question. So um, I guess I'll end by leaving you one of the answers that I've written for myself to kind of reconcile uh, both of these pieces of my life. And I hope that someday you'll have a chance to read it. Uh, and I hope that one day you'll find time to write one for yourself. Thank you. Um, wow, wow, Rani. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like there was much more and I kind of went very fast, but I appreciate being able to say all these things. Thank you, Shirdi. Oh, my honor and pleasure. Um, and thank you on behalf of the team. Thank you on behalf of everybody here. Um, it seems um, onerous 
to ask an appropriately um, significant question, but I will try. Um, the story you told us, if I were to essentialize, uh, was of one with incredible insider credentials uh, and nevertheless outsider values. Um, now that you're in this new space in Princeton with this new uh, motto, how do you navigate this boundary between being an insider and outsider in a place like academia? I think for me, one of the struggles is that it's hard to feel belonging in a system that is designed for you not to belong because it puts you in a situation where you're forced to pretend. So I think the only motto I've come back with is public honesty, is that no longer will I walk in a meeting and not say something about sexism. It's on my mind. Uh, not say something about racism. It's on my mind. And before, while I maybe always tried to help people feel gentle and included, I now accept that maybe I am just disruptive and uncomfortable. And perhaps I make people uncomfortable all the time. And now I'm just not going to hide it. It just still sucks, <laughs> but pretending sucked more. So I, I guess that's that's what I feel like now. Um, but again, you can ask me in five years how how well this new new seven year postdoc is going. Um, we will indeed have you back <laughs> as an update in living history. Uh, let me follow up with a question that I imagine is on many of the audience's mind, which is that you are. Uh, I said I won't gush, but iconic to so many of us because you are a rare example, amongst other reasons, because you're a rare example of a woman of color who has uh, been cherished in spaces that many of us can only imagine ever belonging in. Um, in this context, how do you negotiate being authentic about being in those spaces, not being all that for you? It's certainly not easy. I think that authentically to most people now, I come across as angry, but then I'm often surprised. Like what's surprising about that? Look what's happening all around us. Roe v. Wade just got overturned. Like, why would I not be angry? And I think that coming across authentically right now in face of the Supreme Court justice ruling and everything is actually even more risky than it was before. But at this stage of my life, if I can't take risk after everything, I like you said, I have been invited into these spaces as a brown woman, not as a black woman, which is a completely different ball game, but even as a brown woman, I have been invited into these white male spaces. Maybe it's, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough. Maybe the glossy brochure won't be so glossy. Maybe it'll be kind of angry looking. But I think that is, it is my chance to take that risk. I don't enjoy it. I wish it were not so. But but I accept that actually that is what makes, makes my life purposeful or meaningful. So I, I do think that being invited into those spaces, however surprising or confusing it is, since I think I rejected the spaces all along and then kept getting in, so I don't understand. Maybe it'll happen again. Maybe because I I get in and I can say these things, maybe some changes will happen and that will be that will be enough. But even being understood and loved by so many people for saying the things I do is, of course, a great comfort to me too. And so there is a community where I belong, even if it's not this one. I do feel like there are communities out there where I walk in and everybody greets me as if I am one of them. So that that is an incredible feeling that, you know, I cannot, I will never give up, never want to give up willingly. Wow, powerful words. Thank you so much, Radhika, on behalf of the audience again. And I'm closing the recording. 